Good afternoon and welcome to Miller Thompson's Health Industry Group Health System Transformation Seminar Series. Uh, we're so delighted to be back with you with our System Transformation Seminar Series today on the topic of the Ontario Health Team Implementation Restart. I'm Karima Kanani, a leader in our health industry practice here at Miller Thompson. Before we dive into our material today, I just want to cover off a few quick housekeeping items. Some of this will be uh, familiar to you, uh, many of you who have participated in our sessions before. Um, but just to remind us all, we do have a significant number of organizations participating in this session today. And so for uh, ease and convenience and ensuring that all of our colleagues can hear the information clearly, all of your lines have been muted. We request that you leave them on mute throughout the course of the webinar today. Um, if uh, by chance your uh, site does come off mute, uh, you will be automatically muted again from our end. Um, beyond that, we ask that you hold your questions and comments. There is a lot of information that we wanna cover with you in what will become a very short hour that we have together. And so we will not be able to hold a full open Q&A at the end of the session, especially also considering the number of organizations involved. So do hold your questions, but I invite you to contact me after the session at any time with any questions or further discussion that you might like to have on the topic. And my full contact information is available there on the slides, although I suspect most of you know exactly where to find me. So what's our agenda with the hour that we have together today? Um, we're gonna talk about where we are with Ontario health teams in the province, and I'll give you a bit of a, a status update. There's then since been a new Ontario health team application that's been introduced by the ministry. And so I'm gonna spend a little time talking about that application in specific and what are the differences between what was being asked before and what is being asked now and what that should mean to each of you. There's also new guidance around the collaborative decision making. And so we're gonna spend a little time together looking more specifically at those requirements and items that you should keep in mind as you begin to have dialogue about collaborative decision making models at your various Ontario health team tables. And last, but certainly not least, we're gonna talk about action items. Um, you know, that I always like to leave you with something practical and tangible that you can move forward with. And so I will provide some specific action items for Ontario health teams at each stage of the Ontario health team journey. So can we believe that the Connecting Care Act 2019 actually came into force back in June of 2019, uh, which is now well over a year that time has passed so quickly. At the time, it felt like everything was happening with great speed in the implementation of the health system transformation in the province. What the Connecting Care Act did was create, as we all know, the central agency, Ontario Health, that is now well into its operations, as well as Ontario Health Teams. Now, at the time, you recall, they were called Integrated Care Delivery Systems. And since then, the legislation has been updated and now we are all referring to it consistently as Ontario Health Teams. The Act, in its provisions on Ontario Health Teams specifically, has not changed uh, since that time. And what it provided for was for the minister to designate a person or entity or group of persons or entities as an Ontario Health Team, provided you can deliver services in an integrated and coordinated manner to at least three of the following types that are in the list in front of you. And I'm, I'm not gonna go through the list, although we will talk about it today. And I wanna come back to these basics on what the act prescribed around Ontario health teams because so much time has passed now since the act was introduced and we're well into implementation because under the legislation, these are still what the core requirements are for how a team is created and what its basic minimum is in order to be designated. 
What, of course, the Act also said that you have to meet any prescribed conditions or requirements that also may be introduced. And we know that over time, there have been a developing number of additional requirements and conditions that Ontario health teams need to contend with in order to be able to move through the process through to designation. It is a process. And at the fully mature state, which I remind everyone is not where we are at right now, we're at a very preliminary stage in this process, but at a fully mature state, the intention, the vision is that Ontario health teams will be groups of providers and organizations that are clinically and fiscally accountable for delivering a full and coordinated continuum of care to a defined geographic population. And so as we move through the stages of our Ontario health team development and creation, we wanna keep in mind where the ultimate mature state is. In fact, in order to be designated under the act, ultimately, one has to be able to meet all of these requisite requirements. So where then in the development process are we now? Well, there's been quite a process that's been set out by the ministry that it has been following over a period of several months, and we are now going through more than one iteration through the process. It starts, it started, I guess I should say, with a self-assessment of readiness, and that self-assessment process enabled the ministry to identify teams that were going to be placed in discovery, those that would be in development, and then those that would be invited to make a full application. In fact, those who then come through a full application process are now being referred to as the approved Ontario Health Teams. They're the ones that are at that stage three of moving into implementation. Ultimately, stage four will be the designated Ontario Health Team which, as I mentioned, is reflective of the Ontario health team at mature state. That's where there is clinical and fiscal integration and an integrated funding envelope and single accountability agreement for the team as a whole. So again, it's important to keep in mind where the journey with Ontario health teams is intended to take us as we move through these various stages. Now, among all of you participating today, we do have organizations and groups that are at every stage of this process. Some of you are in discovery, others in development, some of you are about to work on applications, and others of you have been approved in that process and are now moving forward to implementation. So appreciating the breadth and diversity amongst all of you, um, I am going to cover the material today from the viewpoint of being inclusive to the stage that everyone is at, and then I'll speak to each of those stages that you're at towards the end of the session. But really, all of the concepts and, and topics that we're going to talk about, whether they be the evolution of the application or the evolution around the requirements on decision making, are of equal interest to every team across the process. So regardless of where you are in the journey, what we are talking about today is relevant to either how you're planning forward or how you might take a relook at some of the planning that you have already done. In December, the ministry had announced 24 Ontario health teams that would be moving forward to implementation. It was a very exciting month in December as those Announcements were made uh, one at a time across the province. After that, uh, shortly after that, it was uh, when the unfortunate COVID-19 pandemic um, descended on all of us. And we have all collectively as a sector been uh, aggressively responding to that as a community. The, the nice part of, of looking at what's happened during the time of COVID-19 is recognizing that a lot of the integration and concepts that we were talking about at Ontario Health Team tables 
actually or just organically coming together on the ground in order to be able to respond to the pandemic as a community and um, and be able to address issues of, of capacity, uh, of need, and just support uh, among organizations across the continuum in the delivery of care. And so that has, you know, continued the work of Ontario Health Teams, although technically the, the formal process during that time has gone on pause. The ministry has now taken the pause off the final, you know, the formal process, but it's, although it's called an Ontario Health Team restart, you know, I give the commentary about how our sector more generally has responded to COVID-19, because for many of us and many Ontario Health Team tables, it's not really a restart, it's a continuation of the work that you were already doing. It's more of a restart of the formal ministry processes to advance groups through that process. And in fact, in July of 2020, they were, there were five additional Ontario health teams that were announced that were gonna also move forward into implementation, bringing that approved Ontario health team total up to 29. And 17 of the in development teams have now been invited to move forward to the full application process. And that's part of what we're gonna talk about today. Those full application submissions are due on September 18. Now, the ministry has really recognized and been very responsive to the realities that have faced the sector in responding to the pandemic and coping with COVID-19, as well as continued contingency planning for what we don't know what might come as the months progress. And so there is a recognition that there is flexibility around that deadline and that if there are groups or areas of the province that are strained in resources um, or time uh, due to managing the other matters related to the pandemic, that the ministry will work with, with those groups. So although there is that deadline, there is some flexibility for those uh, who need to put up their hand and ask for it. So the process itself hasn't changed, right? Some of the components of the process, what you are being asked to do, what the requirements are around decision making, all of which we're going to talk about today in detail. Some of those things have changed, but the process itself has not changed. So we now have 29 of the Ontario health teams that are approved to implementation. They are sitting in that operational integration stage, and that is what those groups are going to be working on. The remainder of you, whether you're in discovery or you're in development, or there's many of you who are also in, uh, um, identified as innovation, uh, Ontario health teams, you're all still sitting in the planning and design phase of, of the process. And so we can see that we're still heavily on one end of the full process that would bring us forward to a designated Ontario health team. The operational integration work is about putting into action and creating proof of concept for those year one initiatives that the Ontario health teams have been asked to identify. And while the ministry has indicated that there will now be some um, funding forthcoming for this implementation phase, uh, certainly an announcement that has been uh, welcome and appreciated by the sector at large, those funds are for implementation activity and they do not reflect or trigger the financial integration stage of this process. The financial integration stage of the process is where the Ontario health teams will begin to have that joint fiscal accountability and integrated funding envelope. That is not what is occurring at this time. So when you're hearing the ministry talk about uh, funding and needing to have certain decision-making in place to receive implementation funding, that is around the work of the Ontario health team. Um, each of the members will continue to have their own funding and accountability relationships directly with the ministry or the LINS as you currently have at this time. 
during this operational integration stage of the Ontario Health Team development process. So on the newly introduced financial component, I will talk about that more today, but I want to make that very clear that that is not the financial integration piece that we're talking about in this health team development process that would then lead to the future designation as an Ontario health team. What is clear is that Ontario health teams will evolve over time. And this is something that has been explicitly acknowledged by the ministry um, throughout the process, but also uh, within its most recent communications around the new materials changes and this restart process is that the Ontario health teams will design and plan and develop themselves at stages throughout this process. Part of that will be built based on the trust that's around the table, but also the slow and organic evolution of your relationships within the Ontario health team and the development of integration activity and opportunity within your health team table. And so it is expected that it's going to change and evolve over time. This is not a point in time exercise. So as we begin to talk about planning and design and decision making, it's what are you doing that is right for the health team right now? Appreciating and building in the requirement and the crossroads at which that review and refresh will take place as you continue to move through these stages. So what you may put in place at the operational integration stage um, is what is going to be appropriate at this stage of the process. And you need to revisit that framework, that decision making, that engagement once we begin having that discussion around financial integration and more uh, integrated accountability and integrated funding envelope. So what's changed then, right? The process is the same. We're still looking at the same steps along the route uh, to get to designation of an Ontario health team. We're still looking at the same process and phases of in discovery development application that the ministry is looking at. So while the process hasn't changed, the what is required to move through the process and what the ministry is looking at has changed. And part of that is the responsiveness that the ministry has had both to looking at the early Ontario health teams that have moved through the process and feedback that's been received about that process and lessons learned. It's an evolving exercise for everyone involved, as well as recognizing the work and the organic relationships that have been created through the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as just the realities of time and pressure on the system that has been created by the pandemic and what is realistic and reasonable to request of organizations within this time um, to actually engage in full system transformation. You know, the Connecting Care Act is substantially transforming the way that we engage in our healthcare system in a way that hasn't occurred uh, in, in many years. Um, the super agency in Ontario Health is beginning to uh, really take a, a, an active role, and we're going to continue to see that change and evolve over time. Um, but it is commendable that there is this recognition and ability for the process to be adjusted um, and to be responsive to what the needs are of the health provider community. And so with that, um, the ministry has made clear that system transformation is going to continue. It is still a priority for this province and Ontario health teams are still here to stay and the health team assessment and development process as it was originally conceived is continuing forward. What they have done is taken a relook at the application form. Now, those of you who previously went through the application process or have looked at the application process know that it was extremely extensive. It required a significant amount of work and manpower at the Ontario health team tables 
to do a credible job of putting together the application submissions that were required. The new application form is a lot less onerous than what it was, significantly so. Um, and part of that, again, is, you know, recognizing the pressures on the system and, and what is like the necessary information that the ministry needs to have at this juncture in order to move teams forward in the process. What's also shifted is where are we in this process in the province? With 29 of the teams already approved into implementation, we're looking at a different geography of where the opportunities lie for Ontario health teams. And the ministry has been very candid in communicating that it is shifting its focus on parts of the province that have no or limited Ontario health team activity at this time. So they've always indicated from the beginning that the vision and the intention is for Ontario health teams to be across the province and they are still looking for full provincial coverage. And so the focus now is what are the areas in the province that remain to have Ontario health teams that are approved to cover that geography. That's not to say that others that are at other stages of the process um, are removed from the process. You haven't been, but it may be that you need to look at ways that you can adjust yourself or work with partners in your communities in order to be able to advance the interests of your group. And I will talk about that a little bit later today as we talk about the different types um, of teams and stages of the process. For now, what I want to take a few minutes to do is to walk us through together the new Ontario Health Team application. And even if, as I said at the beginning, even if you are not one of these 17 teams that are going to be filling out this application within the next month or so, it is still very relevant to those who have come through the process as you take a relook at some of your planning and extremely relevant to those who are still going to follow in this process as you begin to adjust your thinking and anticipate what the ministry will be looking for in order to move forward. And so we're going to do a bit of a highlight. I can't obviously go through every aspect of the application in, in detail. That would be a, a full session between us, but we will park on each of the sections. And there are now five sections to the application. This is reduced from uh, the previous uh, number of sections of the application and appendices that were required. Um, and so it's much more uh, succinct within these five categories. The first is about your population. So one of the key concepts in the Ontario Health Team Development process uh, that has evolved over time has been the one of an attributed population for your Ontario health team. That concept is still there and it is still a very core component of the Ontario health team model. You will receive as a team, if you haven't already, information around your attributed population and it is based on that information that you will do some of your work in planning around the team and specifically around your year one population that you'll need to identify as your priority. Now, the ministry has recognized that this process began and this collaborative planning began prior to a very you know, significant uh, shift in relationships and, and priorities that occurred due to COVID-19. And so they've explicitly acknowledged that you know, for those who have made submissions previously in the process, whether it was your in your self-assessment, in your development progress, through the process, may want to go back and take a relook at what are the priority populations and priority initiatives that you've selected for year one, um, if there are going to be changes that would be merited due to COVID-19 and the priorities that it has created within your region. This will not be the case necessarily for everyone, but there are certainly areas of the province that would merit a, a relook at some of the year one populations and population uh, initiatives. 
Interesting also to the to the new application is the emphasis on equity considerations. So this was there. It was there in the original application. It's not entirely new, um, but there's a greater emphasis in the way that it's framed and requested in this new form of application. And as we know from recent uh, data that has been released um, from the diversity perspective uh, related to COVID-19 uh, within the province, that there are uh, some stark statistics around health equity and population health that have come to light in communities that have been most uh, affected and impacted by COVID-19. And so in this new application, there is an emphasis on equity considerations. There's been an explicit reference introduced specifically around racialized communities and health inequities. And all teams are asked to look at that in terms of how their collaboration, their initiatives, and their early planning are going to be responsive to these health equity and population health considerations. The second area of the application is again about your team. And there's been a bit of a shift in the terminology that is now being used by the ministry. And you'll see reference now to partnerships, partnerships that are being built across primary care, home and community care, both, um, as well as secondary care, which includes from their perspective, acute inpatient ambulatory and surgical services. It's interesting that they have framed and phrased it this way. Um, the application then goes on to add some layers onto these partnerships, um, including uh, highlighting how you're going to work with the LIN to support capacity building and the potential for transition of home and community care services. So this, of course, coming out of recent uh, legislation that has been passed in that regard. There's specific mention around efforts to engage with public health. So again, this becomes important in using our Ontario health teams and developing them in a manner that will be responsive to COVID-19 and other health emergencies. And then specific and separate mention around efforts to engage with congregate care settings, including long-term care, which we are all very familiar with, have been uniquely challenged during this most recent time. And so it is interesting that the application um, has taken this approach to how you're identifying uh, your team and how it's going to engage and who it's going to uh, engage with. And I come back to reminding you that the act itself remains as what it says. I mean, it still requires that you have coverage of at least three of the areas of as, as set out in the act. So, so that hasn't changed. Um, I think here just the, the framing of the partnerships that are at the table and the core areas where efforts or attention needs to be paid have been emphasized differently. There's been talk and discussion for some time around how these Ontario health teams are to be constituted. The early application made very clear that the preference is for each organization to be the member of only one Ontario health team. And it was quickly recognized across the province that for many health providers, this would be a challenge by the very nature of the services that are rendered and the broad geographic reach of the organizations in the services that they deliver from a multi-site or provincial or regional perspective. And so once again, there is recognition in this app new application that physicians and healthcare organizations should be member of one Ontario health team, but there's a broader list of what those exceptions to that basic rule are. And that includes healthcare providers practicing in multiple regions, home care providers, community support providers, provincial organizations that have local delivery, as well as provincial and regional centers. So what I will highlight here for you that is extremely important 
if you are one of those organizations that fall under this list of exceptions that you are looking at, is that while the process may recognize your ability to be a member of more than one Ontario health team, having your organization participate in more than one Ontario health team in itself carries its own challenges not only during the planning and design and development stage, when you are you know, engaged at multiple tables and with multiple teams, but also on a go forward basis, as we continue to look forward to end mature state, where we're talking about an integrated accountability and an integrated funding envelope. And so while we are not there now, for those of you who are in the exception category, I do caution you to move forward carefully in how you're engaging with these teams, be very proactive and deliberate in your thinking so that you're looking at it not only on a short term, but long term basis for yourself as well. Also interesting in the new application is that the commentary around affiliates and other collaborators has been removed. This is not to say that you wouldn't be engaging in those relationships but they're not required uh, of you and you're not required to attest to them in the same way in this new application. Section three in the application is lessons learned from COVID-19. In fact, COVID-19 is woven through almost every section of the new application. And rightly so should it be, because it is very much a stark reality that we are all dealing with on the front lines on a daily basis. And any of our planning needs to be responsive and reflective to that reality, not only at the current time, but in future planning. This section of the application is entirely new and focuses specifically on COVID-19 response. And what it asks you is, how have you responded to the COVID-19 pandemic? Um, has it changed the types of services that your team offers within the community? Have you done new or different things? Essentially, what has your group been doing to respond to COVID-19 collectively as a collaborative group in the community? And they've provided some examples. These are their examples, not mine. Um, emergency department diversion, telemedicine, um, dealing with chronic disease management, changes in the way home care is being approached. So these are all examples of the ministry is offering of the types of information that they are seeking. What they're also looking for is to understand from groups whether some of those initiatives that have been taken were point in time initiatives as part of COVID response or whether they're now going to be adopted and further developed and continue into the future as part of the health team services and programming going forward. Um, so certainly some of the virtual and telemedicine work, uh, some of the transitional care, some very unique things happening in the province around transitional care. A lot of this type of programming and initiatives might be things that you reflect on and decide in order to tackle the original problem that began this health transformation exercise, our hallway healthcare conundrum, that some of these initiatives might in fact live on to be able to continue to respond to those challenges. Section four of the application asks about how are you going to transform care? So what are going to be those initiatives that you are looking at in year one? And the previous application already had talked about performance measures, right? Uh, I mean, the, the goal of this exercise is to be able to look at the team and then to measure, has it achieved what we're trying to achieve through the creation of this collaborative vehicle for, for care across the continuum of care? And there were a variety of performance measures that the ministry had previously uh, introduced um, not that they were imposing all of these on every team, but that they were putting them out there to say you need to consider how and which of these measures you're going to use to measure how you engage in your performance as a team. 
And they've added a few new ones, which I've highlighted there for you in red. Those were the ones that are new from, from the new application process. And the new application now requires you to very specifically identify three to five of the measures that you are selecting as a team to track success in year one. And so whether you've already come through this process and are going into implementation, or whether you're still in development, these are kind of key performance measures to almost work back from in some of your planning, right? How are you implementing initiatives and measures and frameworks and structures for decision making that are going to enable you to engage with these performance measures and demonstrate the success and ability of your team to deliver on these metrics and uh, within your one, but also on an ongoing basis. Section four also goes on beyond performance metrics to then talk about virtual care, which we know virtual care has been widely adopted across the province um, very swiftly in order to be able to continue care delivery in a number of different areas across the continuum of care when we went into the COVID lockdown. And so the ministry is looking to learn what virtual care was used um, and what your plans are, again, to be able to continue some of that work, all of us appreciating that at least some level of virtual care is now here to stay for the future. And builds on what was already intended on the digital health planning and digital health uh, solutions that the ministry was looking for. The other component beyond virtual care, of course, was the use of digital health solutions to deliver service and for the sharing and communication of patient information, both among providers, but also with patients themselves. The digital health playbook that the ministry introduced still remains. Um, it's a very comprehensive and well-written uh, document that has been provided to health teams to assist with digital health planning. And so while the application itself does not now require you to provide the same level of diligence and inventory around um, your digital uh, health uh, diligence within your team. That is still necessary activity in support of your work that you will do working with the digital health playbook as you continue planning in this area. Last, but certainly not least is around the implementation planning the implementation plan. Um, includes uh, priority deliverables that you need to look at for three months, six months, 12 months, again, coming back to and tying to those performance measures. Um, but they need to go beyond that now. Your implementation planning now also needs to include contingency planning for COVID-19. How will you respond if there is in fact a second wave and further outbreak of COVID-19 and if COVID-19 continues to plague us for an extended period of time. There is continued invitation through this application to identify any systemic or legal barriers to your care redesign and implementation approaches. And I really do encourage all of you to consider that carefully because the ministry has been quite responsive to um, feedback that has been received through the process in looking at how they can better enable the implementation of the Ontario Health Team vision and what are being felt as pain points in the implementation of that vision and how they might be able to be addressed if they can be through avenues that are available to the ministry. Last but not least, the application must be approved um, by every member. Um, this hasn't changed. This is the same as the application before. And what it communicates is the importance of this juncture and crossroad of the Ontario Health Team development journey. Every member who's going to be a member of the team must sign the application on submission. And it requires board chair sign off, which creates that requirement, that trigger to ensure that at this application stage, 
that the boards and governors of organize, health provider organizations are being engaged in the process. They need to be educated. They need to understand what's happening with the implication and what the process is going to be going forward um, in order to provide this approval at this stage. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about the role of the board as we go into our discussions on on decision making. But again, just you know, to highlight to you that this is you know an, an important stage, but it's not binding. This application is not binding. So while it does require members to sign off and requires board chairs to sign off, you will have necessary legal documents that will follow being approved as an Ontario Health Team that you will need to develop within your Ontario Health Team establishing your terms of engagement. And we're going to talk a little bit about that as we talk about the decision making framework. And when you're engaging in that, there will be a stage at which those agreements among yourselves will become binding contractual relationships. The sign off on the approval is not that, but it is still an important stage um, and one that does require that governance process to be observed. There are some things that are not required in this new application. Some things that have been removed that I want to highlight to you are that there were previously extensive information around the Ontario Health Team governance framework that was requested, including plans for that framework and decision making. There were requirements around the risk analysis of the Ontario Health Team from a 360 enterprise perspective and there were requirements for certain what I call member due diligence which are certain uh, reps and warrants about the the status and performance of other members of your team the key message that I want you to take away on this is that while the application does not require it that means that the ministry is saying they don't need to see it that doesn't mean that you don't need to do it and it is highly recommended. So when I say here, although not required, it's recommended. It's not the ministry that's recommending that you that you do this. It's me. I'm you know recommending and advising you that it is critically important that you still engage in the requisite due diligence, that you still engage in the risk analysis, um, and that you are actively engaged in detailed planning around the framework for your team. Um, and this is true for every member of every Ontario Health Team. And we'll talk a little bit about the implications of decision making um, in a minute. So just a flag for you here that although this is not part of the ministry's formal process, this should still be part of your own process at your Ontario Health Team tables. I want to shift gears now with the time that we have left uh, to spend a little time on the collaborative decision making and then to leave you with some action items going forward. The collaborative decision making is something that is required and it's required certainly for all approved Ontario Health Teams in order to be able to access this new money that will be on the table for Ontario Health Team implementation funding. What the ministry has released is some guidelines um, around that collaborative decision making. And there's been a shift in nomenclature. So whereas pre-COVID, all the materials were talking about the governance of the Ontario Health Team, and you see, saw a lot of materials in industry uh, where we're talking about collaborative governance. If you've been through these sessions with me before, you've also heard me say more than once that that wasn't big G governance, that wasn't board governance. What we were really talking about was collaboration at the, the management and operational level of organizations. And so now there's new nomenclature being used that I personally think is more reflective of what it is that we are actually doing, which is de designing collaborative decision-making frameworks for how we're going to work together on the ground in these collaborative undertakings within the health team. Each team continues to have, as I mentioned before, its own accountability and funding arrangements. 
there are no immediate plans for an integrated funding envelope. And so when we talk about collaborative decision making, we are talking about it at the operational integration stage. And as I flagged earlier, this will evolve over time as the health team matures. We may need to revisit and relook at what are appropriate decision making frameworks. However, in the meantime, Decision making continues for each health team to be self determined and fit for purpose, but the ministry does have certain requirements that it would like your decision making to include. So you're free to design your decision making framework as you wish, as long as you are able to tick the box on the various items that are listed on this slide and I'm not going to repeat them for you. You can all read them here and they're all available and listed in the guidance documents from the. The ministry has been clear they will not prescribe the structure of the Ontario Health Team. They will not prescribe the decision making model or the forms of Ontario Health Team agreements that you enter into on the ground. And I can tell you from experience in working with Ontario Health Teams across the province that there are different models, different models, different frameworks, different agreements that are in place in use across the province. There is no specific provincial standard, and it is not necessarily a, a bad thing that there's no specific provincial standard and that there are these different models and agreements in place and being developed, because what is critical for the future success of your Ontario Health Team is that you develop a model and terms of engagement that best suit your Ontario health team with your local priorities and that suits the needs of the organizations that are at your Ontario health team table. This includes your decision making framework and the authority that will be given to your committee or council um, uh, or board that you set up. It includes what subcommittees or working groups you have if you choose to have them and what they are how you will approach representation at the team table and voting, decision-making, quorum, and resource commitments. Who brings what to the table and what will you require? There is not one size fits all. There is not a right and a wrong. And so while I'm aware that some of you, uh, you know, are sharing materials between you, and that's great, um, from an information sharing perspective, collectively as a sector that we're able to have that type of shared knowledge and experience. I emphasize for you that you should always be looking at what is right for your team. And just because another group used a system or a structure or an approach that may or may not be appropriate for what your team needs and the organizations that you have at your table. The guidance documents also call for patients, families, caregivers, physicians, and other clinicians to be included in decision making. There's a new emphasis on encouraging uh, a range of clinicians to be involved so that there are physicians, but also other clinician, clinical clinicians. Um, and while the ministry has said that these uh, individuals should be involved in decision making, how you include them has not been prescribed, and they've been very uh, explicit in the guidance document that it's up to each health team to determine how you will include, with what role, with what authority, and with what influence. So again, something that has to be responsive um, to what suits each team locally. In order to receive the implementation or project you have to have this decision making in place. So it is uh, something that as an approved team, once you've moved for the 29 teams that are at the approved stage, many already have this collaborative decision making arrangements in place. But for those that don't, in order to access funding, you need to have this in place. So it really is a core component that teams should begin talking about early in the process. But beyond collaborative decision making, you need to go one step further in order to be able to access that project funding, not only from a ministry expectation perspective, but for the perspective of the diligence and framework for success within each Ontario health team. 
you have to identify who your fund holder will be. And there's various names that are going around between groups on this fund holder, funding custodian, financial secretariat. What label you pick is not important. What is important are the terms that you address to set the framework for how this funding will be received, held, and used. Who will receive and hold the funds? How will they be managed? What diligence will you collect as a team on your fund holder? What will you require of them in terms of financial management practices and compliance with transfer payment directives? What authority will be conveyed around the use of the funds? How will you allocate accountability and risk related to that funding and the implementation of that funding? These are all core and critical issues, and it really is precedent setting because this will be the first foray into having shared funds as a group and how they will be administered. And so I encourage you to pay close attention to this and not take it lightly, even though it's just implementation funding, because it will be a foreshadowing of how the group will arrange itself and work together as you continue to move forward with jointly held funds that are provided to you as a group. The collaborative decision making arrangements that you develop each of you as Ontario health teams must be in writing and must be approved by each Ontario health team member. This doesn't mean that this needs to get overly complicated. Many of you have existing MOUs, statements of intent, development agreements. Again, there's a variety of labels and forms that this is taken across the province all of which are acceptable, you can look at what documentation you already have in place and simply add on to it an Ontario Health Team, what I'm calling a funding addendum, it really can be called anything that you like, to add some of these terms around the financial custodian and how the financial secretary will operate and what will be the authority and direction and accountability on funds and add that on to existing agreements that you have most of them that I have seen across the province don't have that component as of yet because we weren't contending with any shared or joint fund opportunities at that stage, so it is something that is new. For those that are in the approved stage, you should actually be already working on actively your Ontario Health Team member agreements in order to be able to go into full implementation and operational integration on your year one initiatives. These are core components that should be included within that agreement itself. So if that's something you've got in progress, this is all these things that we're talking about should be reflected in there and more, not just this. There are others and we've had other conversations here together as a group around the Ontario Health Team Member Agreement, but that would be the place that you would park this. The key message that I want to leave you with on this is please keep it simple. Your ability to implement and operate on these terms and to enforce them and follow them as a group and as a team as you move forward will be significantly enhanced if you keep it to the basics that are necessary and keep it to a simple framework. Um, try, if possible, to avoid multiple agreements. I've seen some documents that are uh, floating around in the sector uh, that are suggesting that you might have multiple documents for the funding component and for the decision making component is sitting somewhere else. Um, you know, and that there could be different layers to decision making and all of this is true, but I would encourage you at this early stage of the process to just keep it as simple as possible. Try to have a 1 stop shop agreement that you can use and function as a group that contains the basic necessities to get started at this operational stage. You can evolve your structures. You can evolve your documents over time, but your best success will be to take it forward in small and simple steps. The ministry has acknowledged that the collaborative decision making can have legal, labor relations, governance, and other implications. You know, it's a, a footnote in their guidance document. So while they removed the risk 
assessment component from the application, they're highlighting back to you in this decision making guidance that, hey, folks, there can be some on the ground implications to what you are doing. And so please be aware of them. And in fact, they've emphasized specifically that Ontario Health Team members should seek advice, should seek expert advice, legal advice on the models that are being selected to ensure that you are aware of the impact and effect on your organization from a legal labor governance and other perspective. And so I highlight that and encourage all of you to keep that in mind. For each of you as members, not only should you be doing that, but your diligence should go, um, should include certain key components that you have in your mind when you're sitting at the table. You want to ensure that any decision making is not going to fetter your independent governance authority of your board, right? Nothing here impacts our, your board decision making or your board accountability. You want to see clearly specified scope. What is in the oat decision making pot and what is out um, specifically on things that pertain to operation initiatives that are entirely unrelated to the oat should not be impacted by this. Will, do, will you have effective participation and representation at the decision making table and a voice in that decision making, right? So not only do you, do you have a chair, do you have a vote? How much does your vote um, impact the decisions that are taken? These are all critical things that even if we're only talking about implementation funding or op you know, early operations right now are going to reflect the continued future of the Ontario Health Team. And ensuring that what is decided, yes, it needs to advance the goals of the Ontario health team, but it also needs to advance the interests of each one of you as members. There needs to be a balance. So you need to look at it from a short and long term perspective from your own organizational interests as well. So, with the last few minutes that we have, I know we've covered a lot of material together today, as we do always. I always like to leave you with something practical uh, that you can take away with you. And so I want to park for a minute on each of the different uh, stages of health team development and to give you some takeaways of what your actions are to kind of get restarted at your own oat tables in the work that you need to do. If you are in discovery, I encourage you to look around your geographic region at the Ontario health teams that have already been approved and identify opportunities for yourself to either partner or engage with those approved teams or to look at where and how you can provide additional or unique provincial coverage, either from a geographic perspective or a service perspective in order to differentiate yourself and to move yourself forward. You will have received feedback from the ministry on your areas of improvement. I would encourage you to look at those and seek support. Seek support from your, your fellow colleagues in other teams that have been able to move forward, as well as uh, you know, advisors that exist within the sector and space in order that are working with other teams. Educate the members within your team on the new application and the new decision making requirements, right? So you can advance yourself by adjusting your planning and your materials to be responsive to what the ministry is seeking at this point in time and looking at the advancement of Ontario health teams in the process. Don't have them already create a foundation for yourself for your development by looking at some Ontario health team starter documents like an MOU. I've talked about some of those before, and of course, continue your good works, continue to collaborate. If you are an Ontario health team in development, I also want you to look around your geographic region to see what other teams have been approved. And again, considering the perspective the ministry is bringing, who can you partner with or what additional or unique provincial coverage from a geographic or service perspective does your team bring to the table that you can showcase? Again, being knowledgeable about all of the new and different requirements that we're talking about today and taking a revisit to the in development progress reports that you would have submitted in January in order to reflect 
the COVID-19 system collaboration efforts that you've engaged in and the new requirements and how they impact your planning. Begin to think forward to the time when you will hopefully have access to implementation funds as you move through the process and begin to look at who would be your funding custodian and what terms would you want for your financial secretariat and start development of an Ontario Health Team Members Agreement. It's not a quick exercise. If your team treats it like a quick exercise or something where you can plug and play a template, you will not be well served in the longer term for your team. You need to give your team time to work through the various components of a member's agreement and come to true collaboration at the table. And of course, continue your good works and continue to collaborate. For those Ontario Health teams that have been invited to application, um, lots of information for you today on the new application that you're going to have to contend with. You need to be, of course, intimately familiar with that because you're going to have to work with it. And similar to your colleagues, you need to identify your custodian. You need to agree on your terms for the financial secretariat. I strongly encourage you to do that in tandem with preparing your application, even though you don't need to submit that information um, to uh, the ministry. You want to, again, be working on your health team uh, members agreement, because once you are approved, hopefully you would go through application and be approved. You need that agreement in place between yourselves from a risk perspective and for a variety of other reasons in order to move into implementation. The application must be approved uh, by your board, signed off by your board chair. Boards of directors need to be brought along in this journey. Please ensure that you are giving them information that is early and comprehensive so that they will be prepared to give you the approvals that you need, both on the application and as you move forward on your health team agreements. Solicit support as you might need it um, on the application, your supporting legal documents, and importantly, board briefing as well so that they can have their questions answered. And of course, continue your good works and continue to collaborate. If you are an approved Ontario health team, you should be well into the development of your Ontario health team members agreement. Um, I would uh, recommend that each Ontario health team member is then able to take away that agreement and have your own uh, risk uh, review done for yourselves on the implications to your organization of engaging in that agreement. You can do that on your own or collectively with others who may be in the same sector or representative class within the Ontario health team framework. But that should be an agreement that is uh, Full, you know, fully developed in order to move into implementation and then executed and approved by each of the members. There is money that's going to be available to you for implementation. I strongly encourage you to be proactive in pursuing it and in demonstrating to the ministry that you have the requisite in place to receive such funding. And you begin begin once you have that foundation of your members agreement in place to looking at your Ontario Health Team Project Agreement. So those are just well, your year one initiatives on the ground, what's happening, who's involved, how will it be implemented, and how will you coordinate your resources? And of course, as with everyone else, continue your good works and continue to collaborate. I do thank you for joining us today and uh, appreciate the few minutes that we've gone over time. The Ontario Health Implementation uh, Restart is actively underway now across the province and impacts all of you that have joined us today. The updated application documents, updated application process, and new collaborative decision-making expectations are important and relevant to become educated on for Ontario Health teams at every stage of the process. You also want to ensure that you're planning, that you're engaging now, that you are reflective of and revisit if necessary, so that you can be responsive to the lessons learned, not only from early stage health teams that have something to teach us all, but also the current COVID realities that are being uh, embraced and managed um, by organizations across the province within your respective communities. All of you should be looking to update your planning and development. 
For each Ontario health team, I recommend that you're looking at the design of your framework and your terms of engagement in a manner that one is simple, but two is suited locally to what is going to be responsive and effective for your Ontario health team in your region. And for each Ontario health team member, I recommend that as you move through this process, that you own the process for yourself in coming to the table. Engage in your own independent due diligence on the health team members that you are going to collaborate with, on the decision-making models that you are going to participate in, and ultimately the Ontario health team agreements that you are going to be signed and bound to comply with going forward. Thank you so much to all of you for joining us today. If you have questions, comments, want to have further dialogue on these topics, please feel free to reach out to us at any time. Um, now that we've restarted uh, Ontario Health Team Implementation, our Health System Transformation Series uh, is certainly restarted again. And I encourage you to uh, keep your eyes open for future sessions as we continue to provide this complimentary support to Ontario Health Team development across the province. Thank you very much.